I'm trying to update the drone, but it won't let me for some reason. video it's a little bit different point where I'm actually gonna take this seriously enough to film myself let me and have like a real camera with a real microphone even though there's a ton of ambient noise in this room and the refrigerator is going I keep looking over here but I don't want to wear sunglasses like Casey Neistat because it looks weird a lot of people get the wrong impression that I'm of the school of thought that your racket can replace your technique but in fact to me there's a lot more supplemental information about how to hit the ball correctly than there is about what racket to use but nonetheless, technique is really important. And I think there are several really, really important aspects of technique that often get overlooked when we talk about these higher swing weights, especially, and certain aspects of your technique that can be wrong that you might not even realize. So to really emphasize this point, getting in real close to the camera, what I'm gonna do is compare and contrast what I see a lot of rec players doing, what I've seen myself doing, this isn't an attack on anyone specifically, to the best forehands in the world, which I would consider Roger Federer and Rafael Nadal. First of all, I think it's really important to take a moment and actually talk about why for the, the Roger and Rafa forehand is so good. Um, and a lot of people think it's just because of the spin and the pace. Well, the spin and the pace is really critical to them winning, but the thing is, a ton of other players can hit that hard. Gasquet, for one, hits 3,000 RPM on both his forehand and his backhand at Roland Garros this year in similar mile per hour to Roger and Rafa. Fernando Verdasco hits a huge forehand with great technique. Gael Monfils. What separates the guys who hit the ball really hard from Roger and Rafa is the fact that they can set their forehand up to be successful so often, so consistently. And that comes from a huge part of footwork, which isn't something we're going to be talking about in this video. It's really important to have good footwork and good court anticipation. That's huge in tennis, uh, regardless what we're talking about. The fact that they have a very compact stroke. It's a long extended arm. The extended arm actually isn't as important as a lot of people make it out to be, but it's a very compact stroke, giving themselves extra time. And it allows them to use that high swing weight and not just have high racket head speed, but get into contact on time. There's a big difference. A lot of people think that when they take the ball late, it's purely because they're not getting enough racket head speed, but that's not really the case. So the first problem is in the take back. The elbow spacing that Roger and Rafa use is usually much greater than what a lot of recreational players are using, but not always. And that's having a good space between the elbow so you can get the racket back directly into the right position. I would say that's not usually a huge problem with most players, but it is something to take note of because it translates into the next stage very directly. What a lot of rec players are doing is taking the back racket back like this, which makes sense if you think about it because you're automatically having the racket in that lag back position. All you have to do is swing forward. So what Roger and Rafa are going to do is they're going to have their open stance. They're going to set the racket. They're going to take it back. They're just going to extend. This is again, something Rick Macy says, and uh, they're just going to hit this pat the dog position just to the side. Now the hand position between these two things is roughly the same. And that's very misleading because we want to think about where the racket needs to be, not the hand. When you have the racket back here in this sort of position, anywhere where it's like this or like this or like this, the racket is fundamentally further back. Now think back to the center of the mass of the racket and the balance point, this little invisible point. This is pretty much where everything happens around. The racket twists around this way. It recoils roughly around here. It's a little bit funky with that. But that's really what decides everything. Just like with any other collision, the center of mass is where everything kind of acts around. So that's really the important point to remember. If we have the racket back here, we're fundamentally further away from the contact point than if we are here. Oh, well, racket tech guy. If the racket is here, it's gonna end up in the same position anyway. Not quite. Because with the Roger Federer and Rafael Nadal technique, you're pulling forward and the racket's inertia or resistance to motion will keep the racket in this position. The racket is not jutting backwards. That's closer to this point where we want to make contact than here. But there's another aspect to it that causes this technique to be bad. And that has to do with consistency. Whether it be players hitting 
balls fed to them, players dealing with really fast balls, players dealing with all sorts of different scenarios, what happens a lot when you pull the racket back here is you start to hunt around. And anecdotally, what we learned with the light racket is that in order to handle a ball that's coming at us very quickly or to produce a lot of pace, we want more racket at speed. So a lot of players, what they end up doing is they start reaching further and further back and they start drifting this around. That might not be a problem with a light racket because you can yank that racket into position into contact really, really hard with your arm and your body combined. But with a heavier racket, you're just not gonna be able to do that. So fundamentally having the racket here in this pet the dog position, you're able to find a more consistent plane as where to take the racket back. Thus making your arc length from start to finish always the same, which will help increase your consistency on that forehand wing. And this lag back becomes easier with a higher swing weight simply because the racket has more inertia. It's gonna to wanna to stay in that position more naturally. So you don't have to do any kind of flicking with the wrist, any kind of tricks or anything. You just leave it there and then you pull. Breaking down old technique is hard to do, but I'll try to give some more videos on some things you can do off the court to help make it that transition more simple and also to just give you some kind of basis when you step out on court so you're not just learning everything from scratch because that tends to fail very quick. We're gonna be dancing back and forth a little bit between the technique and the equipment, but in the few, next few videos, I wanna focus a little bit more on swing weight. This is just a video that I think really needed to be done. Hopefully we'll be having more videos more frequently. I'm hoping to get one up a week or better. We'll see how it goes. So stay tuned.